Hey, how's it, video gamer? Welcome to another episode of the Sega Holic. A year ago, I won these five PlayStation ones from Yahoo Japan auctions. I used Bai for my Yahoo Japan auction service, and I paid over forty-three dollars for the service and shipping. The winning price turned out to be a little over twelve dollars. So for a total price of just a little over fifty-five dollars, I was darn stoked. I purchased this American version from eBay to get a working plug. You can tell the difference between a Japanese and American version of a PS1 by all the stickers on the bottom. These were described as junk by the seller. All of them had the eject button binding. So the cover would not stay closed. This issue is also common with the original PlayStation. Here's one that I already fixed. It's easily fixed by just lubricating the button. Besides the eject button binding, three of them were actually working. One other one was actually not reading CDs, and the last one was not outputting video. This was the one that was not outputting video. It's actually outputting a very faint picture. B T W, please support the channel and subscribe. subscribe. Let's open this thing up to see if there's something visually broken. This tamper sticker needs to be removed to expose the screw underneath. Now we can remove all the remaining exposed screws. To get to the main board underneath, we first need to remove the laser assembly. To remove the laser assembly, disconnect the power cable and the ribbon cable that connects to the main board. Now just remove this shield. Upon visual inspection, I can see nothing physically broken. Since there are no visual clues, we need to find the schematics for the PlayStation 1. This is a simple diagram that I made to explain how video game systems work. Since we have video output issues, we need to look at the DAC or Digital to Analog Converter or RGB Encoder. This is page 5-28 on the schematics. I have a link to it in the video description. This page shows the AV multi-out, and we can backtrack from there to find the broken component or IC. Specifically, we want to look at pin 7, which is a composite video pin. That leads to FB502, which is a ferrite bead magnet. It's a magnet to filter out noise. That leads to this junction, which splits to this Zener diode, which is used for surge protection. On the other side is this 220 microfarad coupling capacitor. Next is a 75 ohm resistor, which finally leads us to pin 8 of the RGB encoder. This is an orientation notch, which can reference to find the right side. This board is revision-51, which you can find here on the main board. This is a high resolution image of a Dash 41 main board. Now we want to find out where the AV multi outs composite pin is and where it leads to on the board. We know that the AV multi out has 12 pins and the screen print on the board gives us a clue. We are counting back on the test points until we reach pin 7. Remember pin 7 is the composite video pin according to the schematic. You can see FB502 actually marked on the board. Now here's a 220 microfarad AC coupling capacitor. And here's the 75 ohm resistor. Now here's the RGB encoder's composite pin. Now here's the orientation notch that shows the chip is upside down according to the viewpoint of the schematic. Here's a map of the path of the composite video out from the RGB encoder all the way to the AV multi-out. To get this information, use your digital multimeters 
continuity mode. Now test to see if your leads are properly plugged in. Plug in an AV cable to the AV multi-alt jack. The middle pin on the RCA connector is supposed to connect to pin 7 on the AV multi-alt. Put one lead on the middle pin on the RCA connector and the other lead to where the AV multi-alt connects on the board. This is confirmation that this point is composite video. Now we can check to see if the composite ground is good. Connect one lead to the outer ring on the composite video connector. Now put your other lead on a known ground point which is the whole outer edge on the board. The ferrite bead leads to a Zener diode package. The path leads from the Zener diode to the cathode on the 220 microfarad capacitor. The anode then leads to the 75 ohm resistor. And finally the 75 ohm resistor leads to pin 8 on the RGB encoder. I'm going to test where the composite video signal fails on this path, although I have a gut feeling that the 220 microfarad coupling capacitor has failed. The anode side of the coupling capacitor has a big pad to put your test leads on. I'm going to use this female RCA jack along with some test leads connected to this breadboard to use as a testing apparatus. You can sacrifice an RCA cable, just strip out the ends and use a female RCA adapter if you don't have a breadboard or a female RCA jack. I'm going to bypass the AV multi out and get the composite signal from points on the board. The first point I'm going to try is on the anode side of the AC coupling capacitor. I'm touching ground with the black lead in my right hand while the yellow lead goes to the anode side of the AC coupling capacitor. Alright, we have video. These test leads are essentially an extension of an RCA cable that leads directly to the display. Now I'm testing the cathode side of the AC coupling capacitor and we can confirm the dim image again. In this test we have essentially isolated the AC coupling capacitor as the bad component. Now for the scary part, removing the capacitor. I also replaced the AC coupling capacitor for the Luma signal for S-Video which I found out was bad when I used a sync on Luma RGB cable with the Framemeister. I used Mauser to order the replacement capacitors. In the search field put 220UF 4V capacitor. The original caps were 220 microfarad 4 volt capacitors. I'm going to be using the same type surface mount capacitor. The original caps were 6.3 millimeters in width and 5 millimeters in height. Just put that into the search parameters. BPW. Enjoying the content? Then crush, crush that like button. 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 I got these Panasonic surface mount capacitors and these were pretty cheap at about 35 cents each. I'm curious to see what the old capacitors measure out to. This first one is open and doesn't even register a reading, but this one's reading is erratic. It must be said that capacitance readings must be taken with the capacitor out of circuit otherwise the readings will not be accurate. Here's the readings for the new capacitors, although it is registering a little high even with the 20% tolerance factored in. Unfortunately, I was not able to video the installation of the capacitors because the camera kept getting in the way. And you can see everything is working fine and I'm darn stoked! Here's a look at my soldering job which turned out pretty good. I'll leave a link in the description to show what technique I used. I also replaced the 220 microfarad capacitor in the audio circuit. Now a final test to see the system is working with Street Fighter. Alright, looks like the little bugger is gonna be okay.
with this awesome Fukukuban controller. Dazlam doesn't have a chance. Now for a complete teardown and cleaning. Use a double zero cross point screwdriver to remove these screws from the upper part of the case. These springs for the memory card flap are extremely small and thin. Be careful not to lose them. I recommend to just leave them on the shielding because it's hard to handle because of the size. Once you get the flaps off, you can remove this clear plastic piece by lifting straight up. Press in on the tabs to release the button. Do the same for the eject button. This is how you remove the door latch. I left the door switch plunger in as it's too risky to break the tabs. This is how to release the door spring. The lid is snapped in place and it's too risky to remove. Interesting that you see Foxconn markings from the famous smartphone manufacturer. After cleaning the parts with some dish soap and a toothbrush, it's now time for final assembly. Remember to remove these LCD screen holder tabs before cleaning. When brushing dust off of the laser assembly, make sure to use an anti-static brush. Use silicone grease to lubricate the gears on the disk drive. Make sure to use silicone grease as other lubricants may eat up the plastic. The tabs on the memory card flaps are super thin and is easily broken, so be careful. BTW, let your voice be heard and leave a comment. After cleaning and lubricating, this PS1 is looking pretty good. Aloha and mahalo!